Turn your Bibles, if you will, with me. I thank God for all that he has done. I just don't know. I just don't know from whence I've come. God is not through with me yet. We're going to be reading out of the book of Revelation, starting at the first the first chapter starting at the first verse. Right. of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified by his angel to his servant John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near.
In Ezekiel 1, 1 through 3, you'll find these words. Now it came to pass in the 30th year in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, that I was among the captains by the rebel Shebar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Sheba, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. Let the church say amen. amen. Now Revelation 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, to bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep these things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. I want to talk to you for a short while on the topic of on the real. On the real. Let me explain that statement to you. <clears throat> because from time to time, I use on the real. And my wife says she doesn't really say it a lot. But there are times in a conversation, there are times when you speak with somebody and you want to be truthful, you want to be factual, you want to cut all the minutia and all the pretentiousness away, and you want to share with them a truth. And what I say is, on the real. This means this is the real deal. This is not pretentious, not phony. This is the real stuff. So I say, listen, on the real, let me share this with you. So today, on the real, I want to share some information with you. It's almost like saying, for real? For real? This is on the real, y'all. If you listen to the writer in both Ezekiel and Revelation, it becomes very clear that both writers are positioned on the precipice of something catalytic that's going to happen, something, something large, something great that's going to happen, something cataclysmic. And both their books thrust us to an unanticipated view of things that are yet to come. But both authors, Ezekiel and John, expose us to celestial constructs where God is testifying to his people and he's saying to John on the Isle of Patmos and Ezekiel on the riverbank, tell my people that they're at the edge of being able to move into something that if they don't get it on real, will leave them lacking and want. Provisions <coughs> of the prophets. What God allowed them to understand that the prophet speaks truths that others cannot see. That's why God has a prophet. Because there's things that we just don't see. And what God does is God sends the prophet that the prophet might plead with others to heed the words of God. <laughs> 
That's why in Revelation you hear him say, those who have ears, let him hear what thou saith the Lord. In other words, our ears can be open and yet we hear not with a discerning truth. What God is not just doing right now, but what God is preparing to do in our lives. So, the vision of the prophet declares God's desire. And he declares God's desire to use us in the here and now for a grand purpose. That purpose, beloved, is to proclaim to the world that God is working through the pain of life to bring goodness to this world. Now Romans 14, 7 says this, that none of us live unto ourselves, and no one dies to themselves. In other words, what the writer is saying is that everything that we are, everything that we have, and everything that we do is because of God. Your talents, they're not your own. Your abilities, they don't belong to you solely. Everything that you have, your intellect, all of it, comes from God. What he wants you to know is that while you're working out your destiny down here on earth, everything that you do, God must get the glory through it. Yeah. <coughs> Martin Luther King died in Memphis, Tennessee, because he realized that there were some sanitation workers who were being maligned and unjustly accused of doing certain things and he understood that no matter what you do or who you say, even if you're a godless man, do that to the best that you can. Do it all to the glory of God. Everything we do, we have to do to the glory of God so that God gets the glory from it. And God gets the glory So that means when I stand at the stove and prepare to cook a meal for my children and my family, I gotta remember that fat bag. <laughs> Taste to it. it. Seasons very well. But the folk who have a propensity for hypertension ought not to have fat back. And so I love my family to life, not to death. I turn the fat back, and then goes a smoked turkey man. So I recognize that that plate I set in front of them to eat is an offering unto Almighty God that builds up the body. That means that salt shaker on the table needs to be put someplace else. And Miss Dash. <laughs> <laughs> that means that when my spouse does something that really gets on my nerves, Instead of speaking in an an attitude that crushes her spirit, we have to learn how to talk so that God would get the glory. Come on, Pastor. Come, let us reason together. The two walk together, except they. Uh, so where am I going to go with some hostility?
ability in some. What did I tell you? Do it all as unto the Lord that he gets the glory, not just from it, but through it. That means on the job. When I'm supposed to be working, I'm not surfing and shopping on the internet. And even if they give me permission, that's not really paying. So everything, God alone must get the glory through our working out our own destiny. Now how, how does that happen? How can God get the glory out of me walk, working through my walking through and working through my destiny? I tell you how it happens. It happens when you understand that every opportunity you have to lead someone to Christ <coughs> is an opportunity that you must be aware of and you must recognize that your behavior has an impact on how people perceive and see you. My father told me a long time ago, live your life as if Jesus were right next to you. Mind the words you say. Be as if Jesus is right next to you. Because you see, brothers and sisters, we must implore the lost to be reconciled in Christ. And you do it not by just what you say, but how we A, C, T. Somebody is watching.
other than that, what moves us and what gives us our vitality in church becomes a mute testimony to emptiness when we do not communicate that outside the church. So we can shout up here. We can get happy up here. We can wave our hand up here. We can get up here. Back to the music up in here. Matter of fact, we can even testify up in here how good God is, how he brought me out, how he picked me up and turned me around and set my feet on fire ground. We can do all that stuff up in here. And we can do it because it is a comfortable setting. See, if I tell you that God made a way out of nowhere, Brother Purcell Brown can say, Pastor, I understand that. If I tell you he's a miracle worker, Sister Girl can say, Pastor, I know that for a fact. If I say he's been closer to me than any friend to the roof say, I understand that everybody can identify because God has done that for all of us. This is not hostile, but there's somebody out there on the outside to need to know that he will make a way out of nowhere. They know that they can hear that he is bread when you're hungry. They don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Yet people go out there yeah. on the rib, we're failing to do what God has called us to do, to reconcile the lost in Christ. Check this out. The proclamation of the gospel, now I know this, our hearing it, requires a response that affects our personal conversion in three areas. Hearing the gospel means what you're hearing right now requires a response, amen, <coughs> that affects your personal conversion in three areas. One, first area, it will affect your conversion in Christ and make a difference in Christ. Two, it will impact the church. And three, it will impact the world. Amen. You're hearing the proclamation of the gospel impacts those three areas in your life, in your personal conversion. Because you see this, check this out. The reason why today I read Ezekiel and we read Revelation is because God had a word to say to both of them. Yeah. And when in Ezekiel he was a captive, he was in the land of the Chaldeans down by the river Chebar, and he said, the hand of the Lord was upon me. God said, Ezekiel, I want to say something to you. You need to listen up, son. John on the outer Patmos, he said, John, wake up. I've got something you need to hear. Now, the reality of both situations is in Ezekiel and in Revelation, what God was doing in Ezekiel was saying to a captive people, there's hope. It doesn't matter what you're bound in, what's holding you back, there's hope in me. In a relationship with the living God, what he was saying to John is, John, write a word. Because right now, there are things that are going on that people don't understand because what's about to happen will blow their minds. Amen. You all read Revelation. And the first time you read it, there was some scary stuff there. I mean, 23 heavy beasts. Even an angel with two wings and two wings and two more and six wings. But what happened to both Ezekiel and John, they saw something and they said, we can't keep this stuff to ourselves because we see some things that are about to happen and what we've got to do is warn the people and warn the church that God's judgment is about to fall. Come on. 
day and age where we trifle with God and we play with God. And today on the real, what I'm saying, the same God who spoke to Ezekiel, the same God who spoke to John, is speaking today to you. And he's saying, don't play with me. Time is winding up. Christ is coming soon. And I've got a job for you to do. So God wants to use you to accomplish his eternal purpose in the lives of others. But my friends, you cannot dictate to God how he can and when and if he should use you. You must simply avail yourself to whatever and however God directs you. Period. Think about John. John was a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos and God snatched Ezekiel, an exile by the river, Chibar. And he said, warn them, declare to this generation that the time of playing games is over. He said, for I am coming quickly. I don't know about you, but if you read the news or listen to the news, you'll find out that we don't have long to Amen. <coughs> I don't care how close to midnight we think we are, it's closer than that. And because we are sitting back with a sense of contentment, I tell you today that we're too comfortable in this building. No, we're too comfortable in the church building that we can't be the church living. For each of us, name Christ. Your job is to importune the lost to be reconciled to God. Plead with them. To do less is to deny Christ. Say it again. We must importune or plead with the lost to be reconciled to God. That's your job. That's the whole essence of making disciples. Not borrowing from other churches or stealing from the church, but talking to those who are new, who are brand new. And to do less is to deny Christ. Turn to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23.
see that? Verse 18 says, For whom have stood in the counsel of the Lord and have received the heart <clears throat> and perceived and heard his word, who have marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even to cleave this whirlwind, it shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. <clears throat> now God is going to be very clear what's going to happen. Then verse 20, the anger of the Lord shall not be turned until he hath executed and to have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days you shall consider it perfectly. He said, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. Look at verse 22. But if they have stood in my counsel and have caused my people to hear my word, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doing. What do you say? If they really stand in the place where they were part of who I, what I am, they would be telling evil people that they need to turn from their wicked ways. Do you see that? You see, that's what the true followers, people of earth, people have been in my presence, that's what they're to do. They are to tell folk that they need to turn from their evil ways. That, beloved, is powerful and life-changing. God is very clear. Those who truly know him are purposeful about exposing evil and defining God's will. Those who truly know him. What is that real pastor? God's will has always been that we would have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. So that's what disciples are about. That's why we have to walk with folks. That's why evangelism, which is to tell people about Christ, is not enough. You got to walk with them. Ezekiel 9. Verse 1. He cried also in my ear with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand, and one man among them was clothed with linen. That you have six men, he says, who come from a higher thing. And every one had a slaughter weapon in their hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen with a rider's ink cord by his side. And they went in and stood before the brazen altar. And the glory of God of Israel was going up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen which had the righteous acorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go, walk with me, go to the midst of the city, to the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark. So he set a mark. Upon the forehead of those that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. In other words, six men that come with swords, there are those who are going to start. One comes in linen, and he says to them, once again, he says to the man in linen, go into the city, and what I want you to do is find folk who are grieved because of sin, died because of sin, who are heartbroken because of sin. They don't think it, they'll let it go. But they deal with it. And he said, in the next verse, the Lord said, go to the midst of the city, to the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the forehead of those that cry for all the abomination that be done in Mr. Allah. And then to the others he said in my hearing, go you after him through the city and break all them out. Let not your eyes spare Neither had pity, slave, utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin it at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before what? the house. 
And he said, Defile the house, and fill the court with the slain. Go ye therefore. And they went forth and slew in the city. So Jesus was saying, there's evil out there in the city. Nobody doing anything, not, not, not many people know anything about it. So what I want you to do is go find those people who understand sin, who are not winking at sin, and I want you to mark them. And the only people going to be marked is those folks who recognize what sin is and are doing something about it, not just in themselves, but to other people. Everyone else is right now. Do you understand what he's saying here? Don't spare anybody. God is so serious about two things, about us living right, and two, the second thing about us telling folk and helping them to live right, that everyone and anyone who is not has a serious consequence. See, we're to weep and cry because of the sin around us. And we are to preach and proclaim, warning and admonishing everyone, instructing everyone in all wisdom that we might present every person mature in Christ. That's Colossians 1.20. That's our job. We say it again. To preach and proclaim, warning and admonishing everyone, instructing them in all wisdom that we may present every person mature or perfect in Christ. That's our job. We're to have the mark and understand what the mark is. And to recognize those who don't have the mark are the very ones that will be destroyed. And so what is my job description? Look at it again. It's the whole part of walking with somebody. Colossians 1.28. Preach and proclaim, warn and admonish everyone, instructing everyone in all wisdom that we may present them perfect in Christ. That's our job. What? Preach and proclaim. Warn and admonish everyone. Then give them instructions. That is the mark of life. That's what the Father is looking for. Proverbs 11.30 says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins sin, I'm not sorry, who wins souls is wise. Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. On the real, for every one of us, soul winning should be the normal product of our commitment to Christ. Soul winning. The normal part of our lives. And then not that just there, but then we have to develop the capacity for disciple making through our intimacy with him. And when we do that, we see as he sees, we weep over sin as he wept over sin, and then we do something about it. Isaiah 61, verse 4 through 6 says this. They shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall rise up the form of desolation. And they shall repair the ruined cities. The desolation of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the son of the foreigner shall be your plowman and your vine dressers. But you shall be named the priest of the Lord. God wants to use you as a priest. God wants to use you. Because the words you hear are not for you just to accumulate knowledge. God is allowing you to hear that you may respond. That you will take serious the commandment to go and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to observe everything that I have taught you. So everything that you learn, you have a responsibility and an accountability to God to tell and teach somebody else. It's nobody else's job. It's your job. And that love 
But can I be for real, for real? Can I be on the real? What that means for some of us is we've got to come out of our S-I-N. That's right. We have to check ourselves and check our attitude, check our behavior, check that we know we're doing not just wrong, but sinful. That's on the real. Because the reality of it is, is you're hearing it now, and God will hold you accountable. Why? Because you heard it, and it demands a response. Now, to do nothing is to revert to the default mode. See, I got a belief. Because see, everybody thinks we have a choice in how we respond. I don't think so. Well, that's you. You don't have to think so. I think so. Okay. On the real, that's real for you. But here, here's the thing, folks. Understand. Even back in the days of Moses, God said, tell them, I set before them life and death. Blessings and curses. Now, because of the limitation of language, there's a word that says, choose you this day who you will serve. And so it sounds like we have a choice. But here's the reality, the pragmatic reality. God says, okay, I'm setting these options in front of you. And he says, that today is a day where decisions have to be made. Moses says, choose you this day. Boom, boom, get a choice. But before he, God could speak to Moses, he said, tell them choose life. He didn't give me an option. He said, choose life. See, that's God's option, choose life. He said, choose life. But I don't choose life. I choose right now death. No, that's default. Because if you don't choose life, you default. If you don't have to choose not life. And that's where we are right now. You who were dead in trespasses and sin, that's default. And so it's not about a choice because he says choose life. That's obedience to this word, but choose life. In other words, do what you were designed to do. That's what the Bible says in man and Christ is a new creation. That's why he gave the Holy Spirit so that you move out of default into life. Default is death. And what you're hearing today, if you choose to do nothing about it, you're in default mode. Amen. That's the real. You're in default mode. And default mode is to be spiritually dead. How can you neglect so great a salvation? With everything that God has done for us, how can we neglect and not do anything? He has come to a default mode. Because there's pleasure. There's pleasure in perversion. There's, there's pleasure in sexual immorality. There's pleasure in walking God. There's pleasure in telling somebody else. Oh, yeah, they, I told them. <laughs> There's pleasure in life. But all that is your default mode. Wonder why we haven't made it? Because we wrestle against it. And the Bible's very clear. Those who mind or obey the things of the Spirit walk not in the flesh. If you're walking in the flesh, and you come here on Sunday, what you have is hokey, hokey religion. <laughs> you put your one foot in, <laughs> one foot out. You put your one foot in, and our good church is shaking out of the But if you do the hokey pokey, and you turn yourself around, and you walk right on out, that's what it's all about. on the 
more real. Yes. I can't get any more real than that. For real, for real. Really. My granddaughter called me the other day because my wife sent her some clothes. And normally my granddaughter talks to me. And so after that conversation with her, she wanted to speak to Randy. And I said to her, I said, well, what if Randy's not here? She said, come on, Poppy, I know Randy's here. We speak to her. I said, no. What if Randy doesn't live here anymore? And that's what she said. Poppy, are you serious? <laughs> Six years old. Oh. Are you serious? And I couldn't do anything but get the phone to my wife. I'm serious today. And I'm giving you the phone. And right now, what God is saying, 